Okay, great. Thank you. So everybody, I am so glad to be here again this year um, to talk about my favorite thing, and that is helping people with chronic kidney disease. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, actually. And y'all are going to have to bear with me just a second because I am. Okay, now I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I hope everyone can see that. Um, <clears throat> so today, this year, last year I talked, I did a little bit different. So last year I included people who were already on dialysis and pre-ESRD um, patients. And so this year, though, I really want to focus more on people who aren't on dialysis yet. I, I can put in a little bit of dialysis, but, but these are the people who come to me really, really wanting help because they want to avoid the dialysis chair. So that's where we're going to go this year. Um, and so before we get started, for everyone here, you know, I don't know your backgrounds, but what I would like for you to do is just think about, you know, what are your goals? Like, why are you listening to me today? Um, has someone told you that your kidneys are damaged? Or maybe you're a diabetic or have high blood pressure and you're at risk for kidney damage. Maybe you have a family member that has kidney damage. Whatever that is, I want you to really think about that and get a strong why behind what you're doing. Because when you have that, that tends to drive um, you to have better outcomes when you start trying to change your diet or change your lifestyle in any way. Um, always having a strong why. And so your why is way more important than my why. But my why for you, my goals for you today are that you will feel empowered, that you absolutely can do something to slow progression of kidney disease. Even if you've told you, been told that you can't, you can. Um, I want you to understand why plant-based nutrition improves your kidney health and your cardiovascular health. Um, because your cardiovascular health, that's the leading cause of death in kidney patients. So anyone I work with, I say, hey, if you're a kidney patient, you're a heart patient. And so we work on both. Um, and then I want you to determine a strategy going forward to improve your diet and meet your personal goals. OK, so we have we have to start here with the unfortunate truth for pre-dialysis patients and really, you know, um, a little background about me. So when I when I came out of school, um, I was doing summer relief at a hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. So as y'all can tell, I am from the South. I live just South of Memphis, Tennessee. I live in Mississippi. And, um, but I was, I was working in Nashville and uh, this company, Renal Care Group contacted me and wanted me to come down and interview to work in a dialysis center. And I said, you know what? Um, I'm going to go. It was, it was, it was in Memphis. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go because my sister lives there and I can visit her. And I'm just going to practice interviewing because I was fresh out of school and I needed some practice. And so I did. And I got there and uh, I really, I decided I wanted that job. And I, I say that because I feel like this is God's calling on my life um, to help people with kidney disease. And also because people with kidney disease tend to be, I feel like left out. Um, you know, everyone knows about pink ribbons for breast cancer and go red for heart month, but kidney patients get left behind. I think that's getting better. But um, so so I feel like I've I've my calling is to step in and help people who maybe aren't being helped. And that is the unfortunate um situation for pre-dialysis patients is that they're not being helped and they're still not being helped. It's better, but not not great. So this is a cross-sectional study of patients um from 2021. Um, and it says over 48%, so they were asking like patients and practitioners, over 48% of CKD, that's chronic kidney disease, patient participants had never seen a dietitian. Um, nearly half reported their doctor never suggested it. Most participants agreed that medical nutrition therapy, that's what dietitians do, is important and um, that it prevents progression of kidney disease. So I had patients, you know, patients usually find me. They're out searching because they know intuitively people know, man, I probably should be doing something with my diet, even though the doctor's telling them it's not going to do any good. Um, patients are interested in being referred to a dietitian or a nutritionist. And most patients, 63% agreed or strongly agreed, they can easily attend another appointment to see a dietitian. So a lot of times doctors will say, oh, well, 
you know, they won't go to another appointment um, or something like that. And I'll tell you, talking about T. Colin Campbell, one thing I learned from him is that we don't we can't decide what someone will or won't do. And this isn't exactly how he said it, but I learned this concept that we teach the truth and then let that person decide what they will or won't do. And so today, if you're listening to me, um, the good news is you are hearing from a from a renal dietitian if you have kidney damage. And so we're going to talk about all the topics of interest that you need to know about. So we're going to talk about protein, acid-based balance, inflammation, the gut kidney axis, uh, phosphorus, potassium, and um, cardiovascular will be weaved all through there as well. Okay, so we're going to start with protein because... <clears throat> Of the three macronutrients, this is the one that is most important for slowing progression of kidney disease, getting a handle on protein. So I know everyone out there talks about, um, oh, we need more protein for this, that, and the other. But if you're a pre-dialysis patient, what you should be thinking is low protein sourced from plants. So it's the type and the amount. Um and if you are late stage, so chronic kidney di disease goes in five stages, one, two, three, four, five. The further, the higher the number, the further along you are in kidney disease. So if you're stage four or five, then sometimes, most of the time, if you're working with me, we would do something called a very low protein diet and would supplement that with keto analogs. And I'm going to tell you what all that is. Okay. Okay. Don't let this side scare you. We're going back to chemistry for a minute. I know you probably had the chemistry in high school, but that's okay. We're just going to make this easy. The top molecule here is carbohydrate. Okay, so you're going to see C's, H's, C's, H's, right? The one to the right here is the one that has the R's. That's fat. And then the bottom is protein. Now, what you're going to notice on this protein molecule over to the left, there's an N with two H's. And that is significant when it comes to kidney disease. So keep that in mind. Let's talk about what happens to protein. Protein comes from two places. It comes from food and what we call endogenous. That's protein stores. So you eat protein and you break down that protein into the individual amino acids, or you can break down protein in your body into individual amino acids. Okay. And those amino acids go through the liver and um, the liver converts that amino group. So let's go back a slide. That N, that's the amino group, converts that to ammonia. Now, this is toxic for the body. So that ammonia then has to go through um, the urea cycle to become a less poisonous compound, urea. Now, if you have gone to the doctor and your kidney patient, think about the word urea. You probably have looked at something like blood urea nitrogen, right? Or urine. So what happens is it goes through the urea cycle. Now it's less toxic and it goes out in the urine, but the kidneys have to filter that. That is why the protein is so important. So we want to have low protein because we're going to de decrease that nitrogen waste that we just saw that was taken off of the amino acid molecule and filtered out through the kidneys. If you eat less protein, that's less your work your kidneys have to do. They don't have to filter that out. Um, and that's going to lessen the kidney load. It's also going to lower what we call intraglomerular pressure. And I'm going to show you what the glomerulus is later, but that's just part of the kidney. Um, it's the functional part of the kidney. It's what filters the blood. And we want the pressure there to be low. All right, so what can we do? We're going to lower the amount of protein and we're going to change the type of protein. Um, <clears throat> these are, so just so you know, I'm not making this up. Um, everything that I'm telling you is evidence-based. Um, these are the, what we call K-Doki guidelines. K-Doki guidelines are just guidelines in America. These are American guidelines um, that we use to um, guide the care of people with kidney disease. And so... Um, these guidelines are based on evidence. They have um, experts looking at the evidence to make sure they're accurate. And this is what it says. Um, and these were updated in 2020. Uh, CKD patients not on dialysis without diabetes. Um, so that would be stages three through five. Under close supervision, that should be under the supervision of a dietitian protein restriction with or without keto analogs. And so you're going to want a low protein diet 
providing about 0.5 to 0.6 grams per kilogram of body weight in my book. So I have a second book. The book that was shown at my introduction is the first book I wrote. The second book I wrote, you can find on Amazon, it's called the same thing, Plant Fed Kidneys, but it's for the patient. The reason I wrote this, the first book was to raise awareness that people with pre-dialysis kidney disease weren't being treated. The second reason, and then, and then patients read it and they said, but Jennifer, you didn't give us like guidelines. You didn't give us recipes. So then I wrote the second one for patients. But the reason I'm telling you that is this. Um, I tell you in that book, you don't have to remember all this right here, like a low protein or a very low protein. It's in there and it shows you how to calculate the amount of protein that you would need. But I want you to know that this is the Kadoki guidelines. If you have diabetes, that protein can go a little bit higher for glucose control. Although I don't 100% agree with this, um, this recommendation because you can still get glucose control with that lower protein intake. It's just a little bit more difficult, especially if I have a patient that's like a normal weight or underweight, it gets to be a little bit of a challenge. Okay. So that's the amount of protein. Now, what about the type of protein? <clears throat> so I love this slide. It's it's old. It's from an old journal, but it's such a great picture because it shows what happens to your kidneys after an animal protein versus a plant protein load. So if you think about people are used to seeing glucose, like um, I eat this food and the glucose does this or it spikes up and comes down, right? So this is showing you the same kind of concept, but with protein and kidneys. And you see here that the post-meat load, that GFR shoots up and comes back down. But if you look at a post-soy load, it's much more level. And so sometimes this can be confusing. People will say, well, don't I want my GFR to be higher? And that GFR is glomerular filtration rate. You should know that lab. That's also, I also have all the lists of labs in that second book, Plant Fed Kidneys um, for the Patient. Um, but your glomerular filtration rate tells you what stage of kidney disease you're in. You do want that high, but not acutely after a meal. You want that high long term. Okay, so let's step into history. Is this a new concept? It is not. In fact, th things have really changed um, in the kidney space. So do you know there used to not be a dialysis center on every corner like there is now um, before, before 1972? In 1972, Medicare... Um, decided that, that it would pay for dialysis. Um, before that, the, it was really hard to even get dialysis. But so, so you had to do something different, right? You couldn't just let somebody fall forward to dialysis and not treat it. So um, <clears throat> these doctors, so you see all the way back to 1918, um, 1963, Giovanetti, 1964, Brenner, 1983, all of these doctors um, <clears throat> had to find a different way to treat kidney disease. And what did they use? Um, they used diet. So <clears throat> they varied a little bit, but um, all of these were low in protein and de-emphasized animal protein. And all of these men were able to show a decrease in uremic symptoms. So... <laughs> Fast forward to today, the University um, of Utah School of Medicine says that for every 33% increase of plant protein in a CKD patient's life, a, a diet, a 23% lower risk of mortality ensues. And that is because you've got to think about yourself as a whole person. Yes, we're focusing on the kidneys. We want to save the kidneys. But we also, as I said before, cardiovascular disease is a big deal. And so you're hearing from other speakers here that when you eat a, a low fat plant based diet, that's going to decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease. Well, the same is true if you have kidney damage. And so that's why you're seeing this lower risk of mortality, all cause mortality, because you're improving your overall health and your kidney health by eating plant protein. And then if you think about <clears throat> the type of protein, what comes in the package? So if you're eating plant-based protein, you're getting zero cholesterol. You're not getting saturated fat unless you're eating the tropical oils. It's very alkaline, which you're going to see why that's important in a little bit. Full of antioxidants, fiber, low uremic waste, um, poorly absorbed phosphorus, and you're not going to get any additives. 